please help me join and welcome Mr. Darrell Phillips. Thank you all. Can you hear me? Yeah. I've got notes and stuff I'm going to need to refer back to. Um, Got a PowerPoint here, so it's not quite so boring listening to a government bureaucrat, if you will. Uh, first of all, I need to lay out and tell you what Pergolot Water and Cable is, okay? You, from the name, I know you've all figured that out, but uh, we were established the light and power side of our business in 1938, so we're 75 years old. The actual water side of the business, which was Perigo Waterworks, uh, started at the turn of the century. Those two were combined in 1984 and we became City Light and Water. So we're providing water, sewer, and electric to the citizens of Paragool. And then in 1991, because of Cardinal Baseball and Razorback Football, we were voted into the cable business. The citizens voted a bond issue in. They taxed themselves and put us in the cable business. And so we've been there. We actually went into competition uh, against an existing big uh, company, Cablevision Inc. out of New Jersey, owns the Madison Square Garden, uh, the hockey teams and basketball and so on at the time. And we went into competition with those folks. And in 1998, they finally sold out to us and we became the sole provider of cable TV services and then about 90, about that same time, 97, we added internet. So we're water, sewer, electric, cable, and internet. We're everything in Paragould except telephone and gas. And we don't want to be telephone. All right, well, I gave it away. How, uh, every little town in Arkansas owns their water and sewer system. Every one of them but only a handful on the electric. And I've already given half of it away. Any ideas, any guesses? You kind of surmise from the screen. I pushed one too many buttons. Well, there's 15 of us to answer that question. And you'll notice the ones close, of course, City Water and Light. Then you see we've got Osceola, Paragool, Piggott, and West Memphis. So there's five of the 15 basically in Northeast Arkansas. Now we're all set up different, every one of us, and I'll talk a little bit about that and how we're governed, uh, and it makes a big difference, as you'll see. But anyway, you all may be from some of your hometowns or what have you and not realized uh, that your hometown, they own the electric company. Now the rest are going to be, you say, who serves electric and the rest of them? It's going to be your Entergy or your co-op. <clears throat> So uh, along that same line, how many own cable, would you guess, in the state? Any, anybody? Very few. About two. And that's Conway Corp and us. And Conway was before us. They've been in the business a long time. They offer telephone, too, by the way, because their proximity to uh, Little Rock, they have to offer triple play. They have to offer the telephone, the internet, and the cable TV. But us being so far northeast Arkansas, we don't do that. Now, besides, landlines are dying, right? How many of y'all have a landline? They said there's 50% of the homes are, da are down to 50% with a landline. It's even lower here. So, anyway. Okay, how about electric cooperatives? Craighead Electrics, any, any guesses? The whole state. Twelve. About 17. And I don't have a printout of those. Now, let me just talk a little bit about co-ops. They are, are set up totally different than a municipal utility or an Entergy. There's 17 of those co-op managers that answer to a mother organization that's in Little Rock. And they supply power and they sell parts to them uh, and basically supply everything that they need. Then the local manager, Brian Duncan, here in Jonesboro for the Craighead area, he manages this, this district or this area. Then he also has an elected board by the members that, that uh, govern what they're going to do and help them make the decisions. And they have tree trimming issues and so on. A lot more than we do. And tree trimming is a nightmare. So 
Anyway, that's, a, that's the best way to make an enemy. I've already learned that. Okay, our electric rates. Uh, our residential rates are about eight cents. Jonesboro is around six. And then uh, City Water and Light and Entergy, they're all in the eight to nine cents per kilowatt hour. So you can kind of see we're all kind of bunched together except City Water and Light. And they, uh, they've owned generation, they've owned coal plants, and they're at a crossroads. They've got White Bluff and Independence that they're going to have to figure out. Are they going to be able to upgrade? Uh, I know they've got a $110 million sitting in the bank that they are waiting to see if they're, that, and that wouldn't be, that would just be their part. You'd have Entergy and the other partners would kick in the other hundreds of millions of dollars to see, uh, to upgrade that plant. And I was reading something today, and it looks like the Obama administration, if they get their way through EPA, they'll basically outlaw any new coal plants. And that's, again, speculation, uh, the way the regs are going to come down, but there'll be a lot of lawsuits and so on over that before it's all said and done. Because this system was built on coal, 52% of the power generated is through coal. I'm not talking Arkansas, I'm talking nationwide. You can't jerk coal out from underneath the mix. You're gonna have to cut up gas. All the fracking is, is bringing in this opportunity to uh, have low, abundant, cheap gas. But what's economics tell you all? Power of supply and demand. You get rid of coal, what happens to gas? Okay. Saw it in 1999. We built a generation plant. Coal or our gas was really cheap. Gas got so high because everybody flooded the market. And then you had distressed gas plants all over the United States, big ones. I'm talking four and 500 megawatts that people walked away from and they were bought for pennies on the dollar. Well, it's a good investment now. Utilities pick those things up. Gas is cheap again. It's in abundant supply. And now they're com becoming a viable option. And we'll talk about wind in a minute, if you're a wind, wind, a friend of wind, I should say. Okay, we are governed by a five-member elected-at-large board. We are, um, I guess, it was set up in, in 1938 by ordinance. You know what I'm talking about? Basically, the city put in an ordinance and said, we're going to have a utility as long as we want to have a utility. And if we decide we don't want a utility, we can change the ordinance and we can become under control of the city. So Perigo Light, Water, and Cable has a five-member elected at large board that I answer to, and they make the decisions on what we're going to do except for rates. And our rates are set by ordinance. And then we go to the mayor and the city council and we get our rate increases. So the Public Service Commission would approve Entergies. The Public Service Commission would be involved in Craighead's rates. But you have the City Council that is going to approve our rates. And that's your protection as a citizen. We go for a rate increase, water, sewer, electric, or cable, and you can go up there and speak your mind. And there's eight City Councilmen, there's four wards, two per ward. And then they're going to do the voting on that. Our commission will only make that recommendation because we're going to recommend it as a staff that we go for a rate increase. So, all right. Um, city, city Water and Lights an improvement district. They don't have to go to the city council for their rate increases. They basically can set their rates internally. Pretty neat, pretty neat deal there. Uh, they have nine elected, as you can see, six representing the wards. I think those are appointed, if I understand that correctly, and then one representing the school, the Jonesboro School District. So, again, different types for different setups. And then all others are through City Hall. Now, the downside to City Hall uh, basically running your t utility is all of your utility money goes into the same pot. And then that pays for fire protection, that pays for police, and your, your, your needed improvements to your utility system, you may not get the money because it's providing fire and uh, police protection and things like that. So from a utility standpoint, we much prefer like we're set up and our money not go in the pot. But practically, most of those folks that I threw up there a while ago, Piggott, West Memphis, Osceola, uh, the ones close by, they're all living out of that pot. City Water and Light, they're separate. So let me show you how that operates too. Uh, everybody gets a piece of the pie, it's just you get it in a different way. 
We have about 60 million in annual revenues, 46 million comes from electric. So you can do the math, the rest of it's left. We're going to pick up on water and sewer. You can't make any money on water and sewer. It's a constant drag on your system. Those sewer lines break, those water lines break, and it's constantly having to spend money. Then you have to build a sewer plant. You have to treat all of that. You have to build a water plant. You have to treat the water. Very expensive. We've got a rate increase coming that'll start October the 1st. We're losing a million dollars in our water and sewer department. All it's going to do is bring us up even because we felt like it'd be tough on the uh, citizens to try and raise it where we need to be. And so at least we can stop the, the, the uh, flow of blood, if you will, and we're looking at trying to maintain our expenses, uh, our staffing, and cut uh, costs any way that we possibly can. And if you're going to be a, a manager in a public entity, it's going to be your responsibility to maintain the line on that. So. And again, that's separate. We don't have to buy fire trucks. We don't have to buy police cars. But let me show you how we do support the city. We pay a franchise fee. All right, they get 5% of electric sales, 3% of cable. So last year we paid about 2.2 million, or it's about 188,000 a month. Yes, ma'am. That goes to the city. So on your electric bill, it's just we'll take that percentage right off of the electric bill itself, right off the cable bill, tack it in, in, onto your bill, total it all up, and then send it to the city. That's how they provide fire protection. That's how they provide police protection in parks and parks and provide services. And that's not their only funding revenue source. Don't get me wrong. Y'all know that, being uh, studying this program. So there's other, other methods. But if you have electric utility, one way or another, you typically reap the benefit of it. So... The budgeting process, we have department managers. Uh, our company is, is split up. The, uh, the executive staff, they work for me, the, the chief financial officer and HR, and then the water, sewer, electric, and cable department manager also answer to me. And then we split the other up under the chief financial officer, and that's our IT manager, uh, any of the, uh, the office manager, and positions like that. And so they have to put together a budget and then the CFO, she makes her projections, uh, and then the two are reconciled, and that's how we come up with a budget. That's how we figure out what we're going to do. Now, in the meantime, the engineering department has been doing studies, and we always try and have a three-year projection of where we're headed. And we'd like to go five years. We did a 20-year uh, three years ago, but you know, as technology changes, that's not going to be a viable plan. And it already changed the very first year we went into, uh, tried to implement it. We already made changes and so on. So as your budget changes, that plan's going to change. But it'll be your responsibility, if you're a manager, to plan for your department and then plan for your overall company. And there's never enough money. It's just like at home. Nothing money can't fix. That money tree... Uh, would fix it all for us. So, all right. Now let's get to, to actually talking about what it's like to uh, to run a, a, a not-for-profit. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's not. What I see is that basically everybody wants a piece of your time, and everybody wants you to solve their problem. Before I go, was there any questions over set up? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Did you all have any questions over how municipals, any of that stuff works, budgets, so on? So, okay. All right. Um, my, my situation is unique. Like Dr. McLean said, I was, uh, for 22 years, I played second fiddle. I was very comfortable with that spot, frankly. Uh, in April, my boss decided to retire. Probably the uh, neatest guy I've ever worked for in my life and taught me so many lessons. And so I was given the opportunity to become the general manager. Uh, I don't know that's something I'd set out to be a long time ago. I came to the utility uh, and worked in the, the sewer lab. Uh, I didn't even know what a sewer plant was, but I learned that and then had the opportunity to move up to the operations superintendent and then the chief operations officer and then finally the general manager spot. Um, but what I see, and I experienced a lot of that as the assistant manager, is that everybody wants you to solve their problem. 
You can't solve everybody's problem. What's that called? That's a good word for it. How about a little bit of micromanaging? Before you know it, you become used to solving everybody's problem and you want to start picking out the paint color and things like that. I had a boss like that. Anybody work for a micromanager out there? That's not any fun, is it? They're going to tell you everything that you have to do. And so uh, you have to force it back onto people and make them solve their own problems. And if they can't solve their own problems, then you probably need to figure out if that person really needs to be on your team. And that's a difficult thing. How, how many folks work for state agencies or government? Just, come on, Amber. Okay, we got a few here. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, um, and I do miss, it, 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 it's weird when the buck actually stops at your desk and you can't go back and buy time and say, man, let me go talk to the boss about that. Let me see what he thinks and buy yourself a little time because they're expecting you to do that. So anyway, still getting used to that. Uh, but that is something that, you know, you have to cope with and think about and uh, deal with, if you will. So, all right. First thing you want to do, I want to fix everything that I don't like, right? I got the power now, and I don't, I don't like that building over there. I don't like that desk over there, and I don't like our starting time, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't like on and on and on, right? You're going to fix everything. Well, are you? Are people going to let you? How about change? Does anybody like change? No. No, because we're what? Why? Creatures of habit. Creatures of habit. How about we're in our comfort zone? How about we're afraid of change? Because we don't know what that's going to be. I've been doing it that way for 20 years. Well, we've had this saying for 20 years there. We truly have. Fight twatty. That's the way we always did it. So you fight twatty. That's the way we always did it. We used to even have badges 20 years ago, but uh, trying to get people to think differently. And we moved it even a step further last year at the end of the year. We made everyone read Who Moved My Cheese? Okay, this is an old book. It's a quick read. If you're managing people, or if you're supervising people, I suggest you have them read this book. It's an hour long, if that long. Or you can go on the internet and watch a cartoon version of it. Um, we had group sessions. We took everybody, we bought 25 of these books, and we passed them around. And each group, after they're done, passed it to the next one. And we had like our electric division, our water division, our cable division. And we all got together, and we sat down and we talked about change and what the book meant. But the bigger ramifications was change in general. And it's not a bad thing, and so, but change is life. The only constant in your life is change, even if you work for a government entity. So anyway, again, I recommend it. Um, all right, next thing that you have to deal with is communications. When you're a supervisor, when you're a manager, or when you're in the top spot, everybody's analyzing what you're saying. They're trying to read into what you're... You may have a harmless speech, and I hear things come back like, well, we, that's not what we were talking about at all. That's not what we meant. But everybody wants to think, you know, this is a, a covert action going on, that you're about to do something big. So you have to think about that when you're talking, and, and be transparent. One thing that just drives me nuts is when we get in a meeting with people that should know what we're talking about, and they say, I didn't know we were doing that. And we got uh, in trouble a couple years ago, and so we implemented weekly staff meetings with our operations people, just so we didn't have to hear, I didn't know we were doing that. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure he did know what we were talking about. But anyway, uh, so communication, we put out memos, we put out emails, we try and talk to the people and let them know, you know, what we've got in mind. Any questions or comments on that? Excuse me, just a minute here. <clears throat> All right. 
And I think this is a good saying. Any problem I've ever had in my working career, you can always be traced back to communication or lack of. So if you're not a communicator, you better learn to be one. If you're an I, if you're an introvert, you better learn to be an E when it comes to dealing with people and talking about what's going on and, and being open uh, to your people, to your staff, and so on. We do Myers-Briggs testing when I say the I and E, so don't be surprised. You have to do, y'all familiar with the personality testing? Any, you know, I see heads nodding. We know what, what your uh, uh, type is. And we especially know your I's and your E's and things like that. So, and that becomes pretty handy to you as a supervisor. So, all right. I want to talk to you a minute. By the way, Dr. McLean, I'm going to plug the uh, administrative leadership class, which y'all can't take it, he tells me. But the online version, these are the books that we use. Uh, the Good to Great book, I've, and I've talked to Dr. McLean's class before on this book. This is, this is a Bible when it comes to hiring. Anybody read this book before? Familiar with it? Okay. One of the main concepts in Good to Great is called getting the right people on the bus. What that means is hiring the right people. Take your time and hire the right person. Don't settle. We have people at work that settle. We don't get to hire very often because we don't have turnover. We've got 120 of us and rarely do we have spots because they come and they stay with us, which is a good thing. Uh, but when we do have a turnover, and usually it's a specialty field, we, we uh, put out our, our feelers, we put out advertising the paper, we have people coming in constantly putting in apps. And then we try and figure out the right person for the job. And I've had managers that settled, and guess what? We ended up having to fire those people because they didn't work out. So take extra time. I don't get involved in hiring, but unfortunately I get involved in the latter. So from, from your standpoint, if you're going to be a supervisor, if you're going to be a manager, you're going to have to hire people and you're going to have to make some of those tough decisions to hire the right person and then if they don't work out, you may have to get rid of that person. Next step, getting the right, seat, right people in the right seat on the bus. That's the second step. Just because you hire someone doesn't mean they're right for that job. You may have to move them around if they're worth keeping. It's said in the book, if you get the right people on the bus and you get them in the right seat on the bus, then the person driving the bus, being the leader, can go anywhere and be successful. And I truly believe that. I can't tell you how strongly I believe, and we talk about this concept when we talk about hiring someone, is that the right person for the bus? Is that the right, or are they going to be in the right seat? I can tell you people in our company that are not in the right seat. We have moved around people. Uh, some have left over it. But that's so important to, to work on that and get it right. So again, Good to Great's very, very good book that, that uh, deals with that. I'm going to read a few of these. I know I'm not supposed to read, but anyway. If you'll see, how you select people is more important than how you manage them once they're on the job. If you start with the right people, you won't have problems later on. Again, famous folks backing that up. But on the other hand, those folks that work for uh, the state agencies, apparently you can't get rid of anybody, can you? Once you, they're basically hired for life, takes an act of Congress. So here's what we do to compensate for that. We create a bureaucracy. So read that and see if you don't think that's correct. I think that's profound. I think we do that both in the public sector and the private sector. Instead of dealing head on with the problem, we take and we um, create rules and we won't punish the one person, we punish everybody instead of dealing with it. That's human nature, it's uncomfortable, you don't like to do that, but that is just so prevalent. Again, that's another philosophy in that book that I think is worth remembering. And. Uh, as you apply that as, as a public manager. 
there most of y'all plan on working in the public sector? Can't hardly talk. Is that okay? John Maxwell, one of uh, my favorite authors and author of uh, Five Levels of Leadership, great book. I'm going to hawk the books that I like tonight. Um, that's a good one, right there. Also, you're going to spend. Um, most leaders spend their time and energy on the wrong people. That's the bottom 20%. And that's the individuals who usually take up most of a leader's time. They're your troublemakers, complainers, and those who are struggling. And that is very uh, right on, head on right there. There's just going to be a small amount of folks that you have to deal with. And again, that goes back to the first principle, making sure you hire the right people for the bus and get them in the right seat. So anyway. <clears throat> Any questions over that? Okay. You get a percentage of these books? I'm sorry? You get a percentage. Percentage, I do, I do. <laughs> I do. So, all right. I think these are some also some good savings from other books that um, what's rewarding gets done. If you hire people and they like what they're doing, they're going to do it and they're going to do a good job with it. And it's going to be rewarding to you, and it's going to be rewarding to them. But you can never pay people enough money to make them care. And that old, that old thing, money's a short-term motivator, and you're thinking, man, let them throw the money at me and I'll try it. Trust me, if you don't like what you're doing, you make all the money in the world, and you'll still be unhappy and want to leave and maybe not produce where you, at the level that you could if you liked what you were doing. So, anyway, there's some funnies. Anyway, okay, ethics. You will be responsible for ethics of the organization, you are the moral compass of the organization. You got to lead by example and to help you out. Right there. You've got internal and external auditors. And there's procedures set up and you'll be, they'll follow them. We have each year an auditor comes in and they run through every purchase order, everything that we buy, everything that we do. They're accountants, remember? Bad. Anyway, yeah, we need to, we're going to have to edit that, okay? <laughs> uh, the, uh, anyway, we've got the auditors, and they check everything that we do. And then we have state bidding requirements. We go by $10,000. Anything under or over $10,000 we bid. I think the state limit's 20, but we've, we kept ours at 10 when they raised it. And so the department manager can spend up to $500. Over $500, I have to sign it, and the chief financial officer has to sign it. So you sign everything. What's that mean? Everything. Everything. Who goes to jail? Right. You got it. So anyway, you're responsible for it. So uh, you sign, I, I sign stuff I don't even know. We have, you got to think you've got uh, a permit to operate a sewer plant from the state. We have to send in monthly uh, discharge monitoring reports where we do our lab analysis. We do, we have he uh, air permits that we send in. Uh, you can't imagine the volume of paperwork that we do that we sign on a daily basis to stay in the business that we do. But you are the person that has to sign, so remember that. Okay. And here's... Y'all, Dr. McLean, y'all talk about... Bell? We haven't talked about this. Okay. That, just in a nutshell, that's ethics gone awry a couple years ago. In fact, it's still playing out. There are... Uh, most of them have went through the prosecution process, but the two main characters, I, th I don't know if they've went. I couldn't find it on the Internet. I tried to update it. But uh, population, 37,000, really poor town. Okay. Uh, the city manager come in, uh, very unscrupulous person, paid himself $1.1 million. You can see what he did. And, and there's the city council paid themselves 96000 each. Typical salary is supposed to be an $8,000. Wow. 
And so they bamboozled the city, if you will, for millions of dollars before they were caught. And they've all been in the process of being prosecuted and found guilty, had to pay the money back, recall election, all thrown out of office, uh, but it's still going through the legal system in California. So again, though, you, you all see what I'm saying, you're the moral compass. If there's not some way to, to uh, um, auditing procedures and things like this, this can happen. Or if you're not a moral person, you know, there it is. That's what can happen. But you as a leader have got to set the tone. You've got to set the example. All right. Um, I'm setting the example. I'll get back to that in just a minute. I think that uh, there are always people, and you, you think about your supervisors, you all are always probably seeing your manager, your supervisor, whatever. If he tells you to be to work on time and then he doesn't show up to work on time, what's that mean? That he's not, his actions are not following his words. I'm a stickler for that. If I, I, that's one of my few things I want you to be to work on time, and I'm going to be to work on time, and I'm going to be early. So I think you have to lead by example. If, if there's a few things that you pick out then you ha as, as some of your principles, then I think you have to stand by those principles and you have to model those principles. And you as a leader will have to do that. So, anyway, any questions? All right, attorneys. In the, that was just a few I could think of. That's something that I seem to deal a lot of my time with. Local attorney for local, environmental from everything from water, uh, wastewater and air permits. We run a generation plant. FCC, y'all can't imagine what cable TV is like. So we have to have help there. Then you have your uh, power contracts, which FERC, that we have to deal with there. Again, these are all specialty. We have a state and legislative issues um, attorney, and then we have basically a retirement attorney that handles our retirement system. And we deal with those folks, and they're very expensive. But that's part of the business, and that's something that you'll do as a manager or supervisor. And it, our managers deal with those too, not just me. It goes on down to the next level. Okay, uh, the press and FOI. Being a public entity, everything you say and do uh, is uh, subject to freedom of information. And Arkansas has a very strong freedom of information law. Our board me uh, meetings are televised live. Uh, periodically the paper shows up. We never know when, but we are live and you can watch us. It's, in fact, it's in the morning at 7 a.m. You can watch our board meeting. Anyway, um, what channel? Uh, well, Paragold Channel 6. So. I don't recommend getting up to see it. It's not much. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll tell a little story. I, was, I told Dr. McLean this. Uh, the Raycom and the Sun and the Dish Network, you know, they were fi fussing here a couple of weeks ago. Well, <clears throat> every cable TV contract has a confidentiality clause. They hide behind that, so we can't tell you what we have to pay. But you would be astounded. Okay? So... The Sun decided they were going to do a story and they asked for the contracts from the other two uh, private entities and they obviously can hide behind the, the confidentiality clause. But they remembered Paragold's a public entity and so what they did is just FOI'd us. And so we spent some money researching uh, what trumps what. Does the FOI law trump the, the contract or vice versa? and come to find out the uh, FOI law uh, trumped it and so we turned it over to them. They haven't done a story, but they can if they want to, so they know how much we pay uh, Channel 8, basically. Now that's, we're, that's unrelated to the whole matter that's going on with Raycom and, and uh, uh, DISH, which they solved their issue and paid whatever they're going to have to pay. So the sign could use freedom of information for you guys to pull the information from your courthouse. Yeah. How mm -hmm. far does that go with the citizens? Or just business? That's just that's just a government entity, taxpayer entity that they can FOI you on that. So and that's personnel records. Uh, we've had our our salaries published back in the 90s. We went through a messy rate increase, and uh, so all that stuff is is subject if you're going to work for the public. So remember that. But anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. All the, the cable TV contracts have that clause, and we understand maybe some of the new ones are going to uh, have a little more stiffer um, 
statements in there where we're supposed to fight fight the FOI on our nickel, which we can't. You know, legally, the law is the law, and we'll have to turn it over. So, but uh, anyway, I thought you might find that a little interesting there. And then finally, the different relationships that you have to deal with, your employees, and then you've got your board members. I didn't deal with the board. Uh, my boss did, but now I deal with them, uh, sometimes a weekly basis. City Hall, the mayor. Uh, I don't deal with the aldermen very much, but I deal with the mayor all the time. And then customers. Anytime we cut the tree wrong, anytime we leave a rut, anytime Channel 4 fades out out of, out of Little Rock, anytime Channel 5 fades out, we get calls. And then the, uh, the cable TV part of it is, generates a tremendous amount of phone calls. And then consultants. We've got every kind imaginable to help us, guide us through our daily operations and uh, try and do it right so, and plan and so on. So, Any questions so far on any of that stuff that we have to deal with? <laughs> okay. I know those seats are getting hard, but we're getting close here, closer. All right, just got a few things of uh, slides here that I just want to throw up here for you to see. And this falls back into, again, a hammer back at you to hire the right people. So anyway, those are, those are pretty neat. Things to think about. And culture is big. And you as a, as a supervisor, a manager, or the, the top leader, you're going to establish a culture and then you're going to try and fit people into that culture that fit into that culture and basically hopefully get the job done. So remember that. And you might think about your present work situation, the culture that you have. Do you know? Do you realize what it is? Have you ever sat back and thought about it? Our, ours is one team, one goal, customer service. That's our mission. And so that's what, that, we're a monopoly. You can't get your electric anywhere else. You can't get your water and sewer anywhere, anywhere else. You can your cable. But I don't ever want us to act like a monopoly and treat customers like any old way that we want to. That's not what we're there for. So, not our culture, if you will. And there's the attitude thing. So, I've always felt like if you take somebody with a good attitude and get to work on time, you can do anything with them. And I think we've seen that in some of our employees. So remember, your attitude makes a difference. Again, back to hiring the right people. I keep hammering that, sorry. But it'll, it'll solve a lot of your problems in the long run. Again, John Maxwell, because I get a percentage of the book sales stuck and clean. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, And that is what it's all about today. I've been told that too. Now, you need to make sure we're all happy because we're serving those customers. So make sure we're all happy because that has a correlation on how, how we're going to treat our customers. Some of our employees have told me that. So and I think that's true. We, by the way, we um, send out letters and we make phone calls if we've had contact with you and we monitor to see how satisfied you are with us. And if you're not satisfied, if we didn't cut that tree limb right, or we didn't fix that rut, or we left a mess with the cable, the cable guys did, we're going to go back out there and do it, and we're going to get it right until you're satisfied. Again, on our cable company, we're going to have, we're almost same day service, but your cable install is going to be two to three days out. I have a daughter in Nashville, and she's, hers was 10 days out. We wouldn't think about doing that. And again, I think that the uh, use of the word I is, is not what we're about in Paragould. It's we, because we have a team that does uh, the managing of the utility. I'd sure hate to think that it was left up to me. I mean, there's, we have good people that have been there a long time that help you look at your water, sewer, electric, and cable TV issues. And then learning from your mistakes, I think that's a good one right there. If you don't ever do anything, you won't ever make a mistake. But if you do and you have a failure, 
as you can see, uh, retired uh, CEO of Procter & Gamble thinks of him as a gift, and he learned by him, and he got better. And his organization, organization got better. So you will make mistakes along the way, along the line, but uh, hopefully you learn from them and you don't uh, commit them again. I think what basically the lesson to be learned there. And then John Carter, he is a Harvard uh, guru on change. And basically, uh, in this program, in the MPA program, it'll be pointed out to you the difference between managing and leading. And that's a good lesson to learn. And you'll have it in multiple classes. Uh, Dr. McLean covers it, I know, in his class. And I know the uh, administrative leadership class covers it. And I know there's others. So again, learn that difference. And then why, uh, we ask, why can't a public entity be run like a private business? Why do we have to say it's, a, it's, it's public, we can give everything away? We're, we're here, uh, we're not here to make a profit, and I understand that. But is it wrong to ask yourself, if you own the company, would you do that? Would you go, uh, would you drive across town to go to break? Um, would you do a procedure this way when you know there's a, a faster, better, cheaper way to do something? And another thing, if I own this company, would I hire that person or keep that person? Would I even hire myself if I own the company? Why, is, when you're running a public entity, can you not do that? I don't know, there's, there seems to be um, that thought out there, well, it's public, you know, and we just can't do that. And Man, we set goals. We have set goals for years. We tie those to compensation. We do uh, performance evaluations. Y'all have went through all of that, right? Most of you? So again, we try and look at it from a business standpoint, but you know, I understand it is a public entity. We're not there for profit. And uh, all the money that we do make is funneled back into improvements into our system. But we still look to see how we can cut our costs just like you would if that money was going in your back pocket. So I think that's an important question. If I was in your shoes and I had the years down the road, if you're going to be able to manage a, a public entity, why not think about that? Why not ask that? Why not look at everything that you do? I think that's pretty profound right there. And then finally, don't chase the money, chase your passion. Money is one thing, but if you don't like what you're doing, uh, you'll never be happy. A few, a last few things that I'll go over in just a second that we deal with on a, on a normal basis. I'll jump past that, just some random thoughts now. We deal with economic development. We try and help bring industry into Paragould. The chamber does all of the forward part of it, but they call us and they say, this, this industry uses so many megawatts of electricity. This industry uses so much uh, water. This industry uses so much sewer. Can you all supply that? And we look at our water plant and we say, yeah, we've got a million gallons capacity, a million gallons per day. Our sewer plant's got three million gallons. Uh, we've got uh, 10 megawatts of power available. And then we are active participant. I sit on the EDC board, Economic Development Board, and so we constantly are involved in that process too as a public entity. Um, I told you we run, run the, the uh, board agenda and the board meetings. Uh, we deal with the industrial customers. Those. Uh, use a lot of electricity and they generate a lot of revenue and so we anytime they call we jump and we try and solve their problem and we try and deal with them and meet their needs um, and then finally planning for the future in water sewer electric uh, cable like I was telling you some of the biggest challenges we have are going to be cable and TV where do y'all cable and internet where do y'all see cable TV going uh -huh. What's going to happen to it? Is it going to be mobile devices, you know, things like that? So we don't know where it's heading. 
you know, we, we see articles every day talking about cable TV dying, and this, like you said, this kind of thing. In so many years, it'll be a la carte and, uh, and as far as your programming and so on. So we're concerned about that. Now, what we're trying to do is increase our bandwidth. And Suddenlink and Ritter both ran fiber lines all the way into Perigo from Jonesboro, and now we have two pipelines bringing in bandwidth. So we've got two gig of capability, which you all may have a lot more than that it, with Suddenlink here. But basically that two gig is going to power Paragould and we're in the process of upgrading our head end, spending, I don't know, maybe $150,000 to do the head end upgrade where all the signal comes to. And then what happens when you upgrade your head end, then your system gets to where it can't pass the signal and you have to upgrade your system. So it's just a constant flow of money going out trying to keep up with the technology and so on. So that's a big thing with us, trying to figure out where in the world we're headed in the planning. So anyway, any questions on that? Y'all might have thoughts on that. I'm ready to head in if you guys don't plan on going digital, digital out there. Yeah, we're going to go digital in 15. We're just behind the times. Everybody else is pretty much digital. We still have analog from 2 through 98 on our digital system. and That's a bandwidth hog. So we'll go to digital. That'll uh, free up some space. In fact, we're just now moving HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, and the Movie Channel from 15 through 18 on the analog and moving it into digital. And people have been doing that for years. When we went into competition, you all think something. The Cablevision had to have a box. Well, we put in a system where you could just screw the cable in the back of the TV. That was our, that was our gimmick. And so you didn't have to have a box. Man, it was great and wonderful. Got rid of all those cable boxes. We come to bite us in the end, okay? It's caught up with us 20 years later. The technology has changed to the point now we are going to have to go back to a box. And that way we can offer more services and, more, and less truck rolls. But the customer will benefit uh, for now cable ready, don't get me wrong, if you stay in the lower digital tier you can still screw into the back of your TV, but if you want your digital tier in the other uh, paid programming you're going to have to have a box. But uh, it'll be a, a lot better service. We've got DVR service and things like that too. So Anyway, cable is, is uh, an animal that we just can't ever get our hands around. It's, it's something that uh, uh, we're looking at consultants right now trying to help us figure out what we're going to do in the future. So maybe got us in the right direction. And then finally, succession planning is a big one. You know, who's going to take my place and who's going to take uh, the chief financial officer's place and who's going to take the department manager's place and so on and so on and so on. So that's your responsibility as a manager, as a supervisor, and even as the, the uh, leader is to groom someone to take your spot. Unless you want someone come in from outside to run your organization. If you can't home grow them, your board will definitely take care of that for you. So anyway, that's in a nutshell, that's what it's, my experience has been this last six months or 26 years, what have you, whichever way you want to look at it. But uh, it's been enjoyable and uh, working for the public is a challenge, as you all know, and especially when you offer the services that we offer. So any other questions or comments? Question out. <laughs> so Darrell, what's the biggest change you've seen in 26 years? Um, the attitude, probably the challenge of the customer, the expectation that they want, they want it, and it's like everybody else, they want it and want it right now. And, you know, they're, they're not tolerant uh, of basically hiccups and mistakes. I think that's one of the biggest things that we deal with. And we do. We jump and we try and, and uh, solve all those issues as fast as we possibly can. Now each of the departments have their changes in, in you talk about cable and internet. Wow. That has changed so, so much that um, it's not even the same business it was in 1991 when we went into business against Cablevision. Yes? Well, I'm one of your customers. Okay. Um, my question is, uh -huh. <laughs> we, we don't complain much, I, we really don't. Um, one of my questions is, with this upgrade, will this get the internet better? Because there are hiccups, yeah. and I'm sure you're aware of it, at like midnight, yeah. 2 a.m. Yes. I'm a, I'm a early, like late, early morning doing homework, and we notice like it just cuts off the time. And I know that's not really your... Well. The reason that happens is Netflix and your gamers come on and play all night long. And so your bandwidth gets sucked up. And so, yeah. 
and in, the number of I'll be right there, the number of uh, gamers basically in your neighborhood. The cable system set up on what's called nodes, and so there's so many homes on a node. There's 70 homes on a node. We've got 250 nodes, and so the the number of people downloading movies in that particular node will definitely have a, an effect on your speed. So the the upgrades that I was talking about, uh, we hope to, um, I guess take our traffic and thin it out and make it better. And then we're in the process of trying to figure out how we can get 10 gig of bandwidth up to Paragool. And there's going to have to be some upgrades to those two new lines that Sudden Link and Ritter just put in. But we're committed to doing that. So. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, e-government, uh, uh, do people have access to uh, information on the website? Yes. Uh -huh. We're in the process though, of rebuilding right now uh, you, because of the, we had a terrible website I think for a, a technology company and so we're in the process of overhauling it and we've got a... Difficulties in finding information they need? Uh, I think that we, we just didn't make a commitment to do a good job to keep the information out there. It's one thing to have a web page and it's another thing not to pay any attention to it and upgrade it. And we, I think we were guilty of that and being a technology company we took it for granted in the process of doing that so there'll be a lot more information out there. So, Yes sir. Um, I'm currently a Sunlight customer um, but what, what way do you see for cable companies as as the, sh the trend seems to be moving from um, watching real-time uh, appointment type TV through cable as it shifts over to a sort of a streaming thing, what tactics do you see? And I'm, I'm mainly just asking this so I know what to scream and suddenly think about later on. Um, <laughs> what tactics do you see for somebody like myself that used to be a cable subscriber but now uses stuff like uh, this Apple TV to get Hulu Plus, Netflix, yeah. and all that? How, how are cable companies going to try to monetize that to where are we going to see an increase in prices for internet service to kind of counteract the money that's being lost? I, I think so. I think that question is, is, has multiple answers. Uh, everybody hates commercials. So the hopper that um, Dish had, now they're in a lawsuit because the commercial TV folks are suing because you can jump over. I understand all the commercials. That's what's called a hopper. You jump over all of it. Uh, but yes, they've got to make up the revenue. And right now the cable companies are going to make up that revenue on the price that they charge per subscriber. They, they come in and they tell us, if you want this channel, you're going to put it in your most viewed package. So they tell us where we got to put it. And so that's our extended basic. We'd love to put it up here in the digital. Problem is we only have 1,200 digital subscribers. So that's 1,200 times whatever that price is. We got 8,000 though back in the extended basic. And so that's where they want to put us or want their program put. How many people are in basic? We only have the economy basic. Mm -hmm. And that's just some very, very basic channels. A couple hundred is all. And I'll tell you what's going on there. People are going to, we lost 197 customers so far this year, cable TV customers. Dish is 19.95, and now Direct has dropped from 29.95 to 19. They run their year with them, then they come back to us, or they take the economy basic, which is $15, take the other $19, and all of a sudden they multiply it a couple hundred channels that they didn't have. Yeah. So, and then they do the hop thing back and forth, back and forth. With us, but I, I do think bandwidth bandwidth is cheaper now. But at some point, it'll uh, it'll start going up to make up for lost revenue on the video side. So kind of a question to town man. That do you ever see an a la carte system coming to effect with uh, with networks like ESPN charging anywhere from seven to twenty per end user? Uh, well. We pray for an a la carte. We would love it. Uh, I don't know technology-wise if our system. We could save the regular cable subscriber who didn't care a thing about ESPN a lot of money. But I don't know that... Well, there, there's probably... Oh, yep, see? We've got some. <laughs> um, I, I think, though, the, the again, the, the uh, programmers will fight a la carte. And I know they will because they don't want you to be able to select what you can pay. They want you to lump it all in there and you pay for everything. So whether the FCC will ever prove it and it's been brought up before. So. Yes. 
Uh, my question is related to evolution. How does your organization do your evolution? Do, I'm sorry, do what now on how the organization? Does, how does your organization do evaluation? Evaluation. I'll, I'll <laughs> your, uh, how does your organization do evaluation? An organization? Yeah. Evaluation. Um, so how does your organization fulfill your mission? Is that what yeah. you're asking? Yeah, evaluation. Evaluation. What? <laughs> I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah. I mean, my question is, uh, how uh, does uh, organization do, uh, uh, his uh, organization do evaluation? Oh, how do you do your evaluation? Oh, evaluation. Employee evaluation. Oh, oh, gee. Everybody loves those. Anyway, uh, we take in, uh, they get a chance to write down what they think their, what they accomplished, what they were proud of, uh, what they were disappointed in, and those are turned into their uh, supervisor, and the supervisor takes that, and then he, he fills out his evalu evaluation, and then he sets goals, and then we sit down and we uh, go over the goals, and we go over the evaluations, and everybody signs off on them. Those are printed back out, and so everybody knows what they have to accomplish. Unfortunately, a lot of them are tasks, they're not necessarily goals, but that's just the way th it works. Then in six months, we sit down and we go over them again. Okay, this is where you're at. So we have a six-month evaluation where you check out and, and kind of see where you're going with your supervisor. And then we have corporate goals, too, that we try and reach that we set for everybody. So saving electricity, saving gas, and because people want to leave their trucks running, things like that. And we, we go about a million and a half miles inside the city limits every year. So it's maybe even more than that the last time I had, the, had that check. So it's a lot, of, a lot of miles inside the city limits. Never leave city limits. But um, anyway, so we, we give them an opportunity to help save, too. So what else? Yes, yes, ma'am. My question is, how would you describe success in your position? My, the what? How would you describe success in your position? To succeed? Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that is a tough... Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I was just had the opportunity. Uh, in my particular case, there was an assistant manager that went to the manager spot, and I was down at the sewer plant mixing all kinds of stuff. And uh, anyway, I had the opportunity. They created the operations superintendent's position. And so bid on it, had, had the education, and I have water and sewer license and all the things. And that just kind of worked into it and then got the education and so on. And so just over you know 26 years, it just worked out really good for me. But uh, I think most of the time in a lot of these organizations and public utilities, most of the time, uh, Jake Rice, you know, was just elevated to uh, assistant manager at CWL. You're going to see a lot of turnover in municipal utilities here in Arkansas. A lot of the managers are about to retire, and so there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And, and they'll look at those people that have been on staff and the accomplishments and things that they've done and how they've moved up in the chain. So I think that's crucial. Uh, City Water and Light pays real well, too. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. A lot better than a lot of people have trouble conceiving of public utilities as nonprofit entities. But as Daryl said, a lot of the advertisements you see for jobs in their trade magazines are actually they prefer a, a MPA over an MBA uh, yeah. because mm -hmm. of the regulatory nature of the job and the things that you have to deal with. So public utilities are often a career that MPA yeah you don't think about. But yeah. Every, 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 in the American Public Power Association magazine, any of the supervisory, it's an advanced degree. So, and an MPA would be a good one, for sure. And sometimes it lists that way, too. Yes, ma'am. What did, um, well, not just y'all, but other towns have learned from, like, these ice storms. Like, what have y'all oh. learned? Like, what have y'all put in place, implement, you know, new policy? Well, y'all not going to hear this, but we cut down trees as as much as we can. After the 2009 ice storms, people that would not let you touch a tree invited us over and we cut them down and ground the stumps. And we, I couldn't tell you how many of those that we were allowed to do. And it's just Memphis and Little Rock. They have a little bit of wind 
They have a major power outage because people don't want those big trees cut. My son-in-law is a lineman in uh, uh, Little Rock, and it's amazing. They just have a puff of wind, and they're working the whole weekend. We don't. We, so we got real aggressive with our tree trimming is what we did, and that saved us a lot of time, a lot of overtime, which saves the customer in the very end. So that's one of the things. And then we've got a mutual aid agreement with those 15 uh, other utilities. We all signed up, and now we help, we help each other. We've been to Hope. We've been to West Memphis. We've been to Jonesboro, uh, Conway. They've been up here and helped us and vice versa and back and forth. So that kind of made those stronger, those bonds, uh, since the 2009 ice storm, which was the worst one since, uh, worse than 1957, I was told. So, anyway, it was a bad one. What's your uh, motto, slogan for the organization? The uh, slogan, uh, motto. Motto. You said one person, uh, one. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah, uh, the vision, uh, the um, mission, I'm sorry. Uh, one team, one goal, customer service. I'm sorry. Brain scrambled. I think I'll do a question. Yes, sir. If we compare your students before 2002 and after 2002. I might have to come up here. Ah, hearing's about gone. I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to ask how uh, much the MBA program uh, improved your staff oh. in management. Okay. Uh, I, th I think tremendously. And I'll tell you why. I think the MPA, you're going to have to write. You're going to have to work in groups. You're going to have to communicate. And yeah, I'll see everybody shaking their head. And that just that's just part of public life. It just exposes you to the real life situations of running a public entity. So tremendously. I've got an MBA and I've got an MPA. And I love the MPA. Okay, that's my passion. I just did the MBA thing. I, you know, kind of one of those things on the side. But the MPA, that's where it's at. And, and I, I know I'm biased. But uh, working in the public entity, uh, it's just it's been a tremendous help to me and furthered my career, not a doubt in my mind. So, go ahead. What else? One take away from public administration, one thing you took away from the program after, what it take you, a couple, a couple of years? I tell you what, I'd... Daryl drive up here after work and take classes. Yeah, I, I, I started it in um, 97, frankly, and I quit. And I, and I went and pursued an MBA at Christian Brothers on the weekend. And I did that. And then I got to looking. And I called uh, uh, Dr. Stewart and, and Dr. McLean here. And they got me back in. And I finished the thing up. And yeah, it, you were in my first, he was yeah, in my first class. Like yeah. So it, so it was, uh, uh, again, one of those things I had to cram it all in. We had six years on a master's. Yeah. I, August was six years. And I finished the last class in August. How for. Did he treat you? I'm sorry. How did he treat you? Oh, he was a tough man. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, again. I trusted Daryl. I actually wrote a paper with him one time. So he was. Yeah, we did. Pretty well. Yeah, we did the Sacopa thing in Little Rock and uh, did a paper. It, it was neat. It sure was. But uh, anyway, you've got a, a great experience. I encourage everybody to finish the degree and uh, stay with it. And I promise it'll open doors for you, especially playing in the public sector, and he didn't pay me to say that, okay? I promise. It's just, again, a passion that I have, and uh, I think you've got something special here, so anyway. What else? Yes, sir? Besides your degree, what other kind of like experiences, like maybe when you were younger, or a job? Well, okay. I felt right now when you had that you use sometimes. Probably a little bit. Um, when I was in college, I worked for the Corps of Engineers in the engineering department, and I picked up a, a bachelor's in electronics from Southeast Missouri State. Uh, that I really thought when I came to the utility, I wanted to work for the cable TV part of it. I didn't realize I wasn't smart enough to know what cable TV is all about, and they did offer me a job. I wanted to get home. I lived in Cardwell. I moved to St. Louis to go to school. My wife did, and we had an opportunity to. Uh, I moved back home. We were living in New Madrid. I was teaching school. I taught uh, electronics, electricity at the New Madrid County Vocational School there, and we had the opportunity to come home. So I think all of those things were factors. 
in my progression on my resume, if you will, when they looked at the operations superintendent job, I had a little bit of wastewater experience, and I had my water license, and I had my sewer license. You have to have those, by the way, to run a water and sewer system. And then I had the education, and I had the, the uh, teaching experience. I dealt with the multiple divisions. I'd been given a little bit of safety. So it all kind of worked together in my favor. Taking on, I encourage you to take on responsibility when it's offered to you, don't shy away from it. Take it. You never know when it's going to help you. Last yeah. When you get time to rest, because I see you got a lot of different entities, local, state, yeah. federal, that you deal with every day. So I'm wondering. Honest to goodness, you could travel three or four days a week. But we've got a guy that travels three or four days a week that takes care of our power issues. Uh, and that's a big thing right now. The Southwest Power Pool, y'all have heard just a little bit about that. Won't bore you to death about that. But it's big. And you've heard of MISO in the paper. That's what City Water and Light, that's what's called a uh, safety organization for the transmission system. And they're going one way and we're going another way because we have to. But. Um, you have to have good staff. You just have to turn it over. You have to empower them. You can't do everything. I, I want to be at the office. I want to deal with the people, with the staff, with the customers, and so on. I don't care a thing about traveling. I can travel all I want to, and I don't. So, anyway, yes, ma'am. Daryl fishes. Yeah, you got to fish. You got to fish. You got to save for relaxation. For that, so, yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What are some examples of what you did to empower your employees? Um, I think, the, like I was talking about, our um, guy that deals with our power resources, we just turn that over to him. Okay, he goes out there and he may call us and say, you know, what do you think? Do, should we sign this contract? Should we do that? And we basically empower him to make those decisions, to let him uh, be out there. He's the face of Paragool Light Water and Cable. He's in Tulsa right now at a very important meeting. And so he. We let them do those kind of things because you have to. Our wastewater treatment uh, lady that runs our uh, lab there, she's known throughout the state. We empower her. She does uh, any, lots of things on the state level. And she implements change out there on how we're going to do procedures and things like that. I mean, so again, they have to, you have to turn them loose, let them do their thing. So. All right. Well. Man, thanks for Thank the opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. So, hopefully, it didn't bore you too bad. So, anyway.